I'm at the count, I'm in Hong Kong at the Air New Guinea counter trying to check in for my flight. I have the reservation of my flight on my phone and I'm trying to show it to the woman uh, behind the counter who's asking me how did I make my reservation. I'm trying to explain to her that all the information you need to print out my boarding pass is on this phone. And she's looking at me like I'm a crazy person because she doesn't get it. <laughs> and we talk in circles for a while and then she says, can you please step aside so she can help the other passengers? So I step aside and I watch as she helps the other passengers and I watch as they board the plane and I watch as the plane pulls away from the gate without me. <laughs> I'm supposed to be in Papua New Guinea. I'm joining an expedition team where we're going to do a comprehensive biodiversity survey of um, the, the flora and fauna of the country from the, from the bottom of the Bismarck Sea to the top of Mount Willem. And it's a team that the expedition's been organized by Philippe Boucher, the scientist from the Paris Museum of Natural History. I like to call him PB, kind of like peanut butter, because if you're not an expedition, he's very essential to have with you. There are about 150 scientists from 20 different countries and we're all gathered in um, Papua New Guinea. Uh, we've, uh, we're sponsored by several foundations, the National Science Foundation, the Monaco Foundation. A lot of people have given us a lot of money to go to Papua New Guinea and do this survey, and my plane has just taken off. <laughs> so I go back to the counter and I ask the woman what time is the next flight to um, Papua New Guinea, and she says, next week. Air New Guinea is the only airline that uh, services the island nation, and there's a direct flight from Hong Kong just once a week. So I was kind of stuck. <laughs> After a series of airline shenanigans no one should ever, ever endure, I finally get to Papua New Guinea. And my first flight takes me to Port Moresby, and the second flight takes me to Medang, where we're based for our field work. Port Moresby and Madang are very different. So Port Moresby is the capital, and when you're there, you see men. You see men everywhere. There are almost no women to be seen. So you, the Papua New Guinea men um, look like Australian Aborigines, and they're mixed in with um, businessmen, Westerners and Chinese businessmen and miners who've come to Papua New Guinea to um, invest in the natural resources. Madang is very different. In Madang, you see families. So it's a, a more rural and it's a, a community of fisher, fishers and farmers and that's where we're based. When I finally get to Madang, because I'm delayed, everyone's out in the field and so they send a driver to pick me up in a pickup truck. And I'm chatting with the driver, he's local, and he's telling me that I'm gonna love, love Papua New Guinea. And I was like, okay, great. And then he goes, um, Papua New Guinea is a country of yesterday and tomorrow. So everyone has a cell phone, but not everyone has a toilet. So they've kind of leapfrogged over some of the important things. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so, um, and I think about this and I realize our, our getting here sort of had some of those dual elements in it. So every time you go on an expedition, you have to ask permission of the country you're visiting um, to go there and to collect samples from the governments. Um, so in addition to getting permissions from the Papua New Guinea government, because parts of the country are still under tribal rule, we also had to go and talk to the tribal leaders because they're landowners. And we had to get permission to swim in the, the seas near their islands and to harbor our boats near their islands. And they graciously agreed. So the 150 scientists are now invading <laughs> Papua New Guinea. And the first day, uh, and we're all excited to go to Papua New Guinea because it's the tip of the biodiversity um, hotspot that we call the coral triangle. And you see creatures there that are very similar to what you see in the Philippines and what you see in the Solomon Islands. And the survey that we're going to do, this comprehensive survey of the Medang Harbor, hadn't been done since the 1970s. So we're all excited because we think we're gonna find all of these new species and we can describe all of these new organisms, new fish, new snails, new, new um, crabs. So we're very excited to go, go on this expedition. And the first day that I go out with the team, there's a group of um, local students who are staring at me and I'm not quite sure why they're staring at me. So I, I go to PB and he says, well, they're not sure what to make of you because you're one of us, but, but you look like them. So 
There are not very many people of color in the expedition. Actually, a lot of the expeditions that come to Papua New Guinea don't have a lot of people that look like Papua New Guineans with them. So the kids are sort of confused by what to do with me because I look like them, but I'm, I'm leading a team, and I'm this girl from Brooklyn, you know, with curly hair and brown skin, and, and so I'm sort of this strange vision for them. It's kind of like a limited edition Bobo Fat doll. It's like... <laughs> Should they play with me or keep me on the shelf in a box? <laughs> so they didn't know what to do. <laughs> so they decided to play with me. <laughs> so over the next couple of weeks, the students work with us as we go out and collect samples. And um, so we're snorkeling, we're diving, beach combing, and then we're sorting out creatures um, into different categories. The day starts at around 6 a.m. and it ends at around 11 p.m. and we work in shifts. In the morning, a team goes out into the field to collect samples. They come back around lunch. They swap with a team who's been there in um, sorting the samples from the day before into different categories. And then that team goes out till dinner, and they come back and then swap with another team that goes out to do night diving. So I'm here in Papua New Guinea because I work with um, predatory marine snails that feed on fish, worms, and other snails. I like to call them killer snails. And so <laughs> our killer snails, they are nocturnal, and they come out at night. And so we usually get our best haul from night diving. So we're in our circuit of you know snorkeling, diving, beachcombing, sorting specimens, and we get an email um, one day that the Prince of Monaco wants to come and join our expedition. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I know we have funding from the Monaco Foundation, but it doesn't dawn on me that it's the Prince Albert the second, like a live living person of Monaco who's gonna come and spend three days with us because he wants to see what his royal dollars are paying for. And so I immediately go to Google because I had no idea who this guy was and, and find out that he's sort of like a playboy and his mom was Grace Kelly and all these other fun facts about him. He's actually very nice. And so, so we're all excited because we're going to have this royal visitor for three days. And so we, on the day that the prince arrives, we plan this big um, fanfare ceremony, as you should, because you're being visited by royalty. So we arrange for the prince to meet the tribal leaders and all of the other dignitaries that are in the Medang area. And we have a big reception at Divine Word um, University. And the hall is dressed with lights and flowers and local food. And there's a receiving line. And all of us are dressed in our field work best, which, which means like day old clothes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the prince is very nice. And he goes around our makeshift lab. And I get to tell him about my research, studying the evolutionary history of these killer snails. And, looking at their venom glands for um, therapeutic compounds. And we show him our live snails that we've collected. And he looks through the microscope at how we dissect out the venom gland. And everything seems to be going really, really, really great. And then um, after the reception, I somehow was invited to ride in the prince's car with him to dinner. And so I was like, oh, this is awkward. So, <laughs> girl from Brooklyn, royalty from Monaco, we're in the back of an SUV, and I, what do we do? So I'm trying to make small talk, and so I say to him, um, what do you think of Air New Guinea? It's kind of a nightmare, right? And, and he looks at me. And he says, Air New Guinea? And he looks at me like I've lost my mind. And then I immediately get it that this is the prince of a country. He has never set foot on Air New Guinea. He, he has his own plane. They go wherever he wants. Only, he's never flown commercial air. It's like only the riffraff will fly commercial air. And so... So much for small talk. I was like, okay. <laughs> so the prince is with us for three days, and we hang out and have a great time. And after the excitement's um, gone, uh, settled down, we go back to our circuit of snorkeling and diving and beachcombing and sorting specimens. And we get a message a few days after the prince leaves from the tribal leaders that they want to speak with us. So we're not quite sure what they want to talk about, but we go. During our time there, for the first three weeks we were there, we've been doing a lot of community outreach activities. So we do things with school groups and the local community. We invite them to the lab so they can see what we're doing. We show them the creatures that we were collecting. And um, so we go 
to meet with the tribal leaders. And, and when we get there, they ask us um, for more money. Or they ask us to, to give them some money so that we can continue our expedition. And we're sort of floored and we're like, what? <laughs> so they think that we're friends of the prince and they think that we have money and they want money for us to continue the expedition. And we're of course like, no, what's gonna happen here? So to kind of stall for time, we asked them for, um, we asked them to give us a number. And so they give us a number and we go back to the lab and we do the conversion and we realize that they're asking us for half a million dollars. $500,000. <laughs> of course we don't have that money. Obviously we don't have that money. We're scientists. And if you know anything about how scientists are funded, our funds come in grants. You know, all the money is written into line items and we didn't bring the bribe the chief stash <laughs> with us. <laughs> and so we're kind of like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And we, and we panic a little bit. And, um, and PB is the best to have on expeditions because he's a great negotiator. But in this instance, he wasn't the only one that saved us. The local students whom we'd been working with, um, they come to our rescue. So they go to the tribal leaders and they plead with them, you know, prince rich, scientist poor. <laughs> and, and they explain to them that, that the work that we're doing in, in Papua New Guinea is really important because we're putting names to creatures that hadn't been seen before. And that's important for them and their training and their experience. And it's also important for the country. And so, for example, when the prince came to visit us, PB had given him uh, a picture of this crab that we'd found, which we thought was a new species. And we named it after the Monaco um, royal family, Acte Grimaldi. And because, and it's a beautiful crab, it's red and it's, it has really white speckles all over its appendages. It's really, really gorgeous. And because we had discovered that crab and we named it after the prince, the prince was now going to be forever tied to Papua New Guinea. And so they explained to the chiefs that what the breakthroughs that we're making in finding these creatures and naming them was going to be really, really important for the island, the country, and for their development as a whole. And what they did in making that plea really was kind of powerful, and it speaks to this power of um, science culture that has to happen. In order for scientists for science to advance, we all have to believe the data that is presented to us by other scientists, right? And so working with these students for the past couple of weeks, we sort of developed this inherent trust that's necessary for science to happen. And they took that trust to the chiefs to explain and negotiate them down and say that we have to be able to continue this expedition because it's important. And so the, the chiefs agreed, and we were able to continue the expedition, and we're all very excited because we're collecting really wonderful things. Species diversity is very, very high. Almost every day we're finding new creatures. By the end of the expedition, We've described more than 30 new um, uh, animals that we've uh, observed. We'd also found hundreds and hundreds of things that had already been described. And so everyone's very excited. But we're also sort of, uh, it's, a, it's a mixed bag because we noticed that um, the intensity and the extent of human impact on this harbor is massive. So since the 70s, the human population in the Medang Harbor had exploded. And even on tiny um, islets, all of those you can find human people, in, um, in all of the islets were inhabited. And so this impact affected the, the reefs. So the shallow reefs were still pretty healthy, but when you went very deep, you didn't find um, such healthy reefs. They were all sort of damaged. And we also found a lot of dwarfism in the specimens that we collected. They were smaller than they should have been. So all in all, it was kind of a great expedition because we described lots of species, but there's a lot of human impact that was causing problems. So we were, we were in a mixed bag. Um, on the last day, as, we were getting ready to, as I was getting ready to leave the expedition, the students came to me and they gave me all of these different gifts. Um, and they gave me these beautiful sarongs, which are gorgeous. And we exchanged emails, and, and I noticed that they, are, they see me different than, than I see myself. So they see in me this girl who looks like them, or the scientist who looks like them, 
who laughs like them, who's doing research on a global scale, who has colleagues all over the world, and who's having fun. And, and I realize that they see their future lives or the lives that they would like to have. And, and to them, I'm a role model. And that's really hard and it sort of hits me because it's not something I want to be or I, I signed up for. <laughs> and, and so I sort of leave Papua New Guinea with, with not knowing how to handle, how to carry that weight of that responsibility. And it's something I, I, I sort of have to think about. So I'll, I'll save you the, the story of how I got out of Papua New Guinea. <laughs> but if you're, ever, if you're ever flying Air New Guinea, um, print your boarding pass <laughs> and drop some water weight in case you have to fly in the jump seat between the pilot and the co-pilot. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>